The topic of UFOs and aliens is an interesting one. You have hardcore believers and those that just can't seem to get on board with the idea. However, this year has shown us that it's not just the general public that has an interest in UFOs. Government officials have shown interest in this phenomena. And not only that, but admitting to setting up several divisions to look into the subject. Some have pointed out that if these objects were just planes, natural phenomena and everyday objects, why would they spend hundreds of millions of dollars looking into the subject? It seems at this point it's fair to say that they're interested in UFOs just as much as the public and that there's a possibility we could be getting more information from them in the near future. Interesting videos and comments have been made in recent years, all of which caused some to think we're part of something much bigger. One recent person that's spoken out about their experiences is that of Demi Lovato. Demi Lovato said the following on Instagram. The past few days I've spent in Joshua Tree with a small group of loved ones and Dr. Stephen Greer and his C5 team. Over the past couple of months I've dug deep into the science of consciousness and experienced not only peace and serenity like I've never known, but I've also witnessed the most incredibly profound sightings both in the sky, as well as feet away from me. This planet is on a very negative path towards destruction, but we can change that together. If we were to get 1% of the population to meditate and make contact, we would force our governments to acknowledge the truth about extraterrestrial life among us and change our destructive habits destroying our planet. This is just some of the evidence from under the stars in the desert sky that can no longer be ignored and must be shed immediately. Make contact yourself. You can download the C5 amp and it will teach you the protocols to connect to life from beyond our planet. P.S. If this doesn't happen on the first try, keep trying. It took me several sessions to tap into a deep enough level of meditation to make contact happy, communicating, end quote. This is massive news coming from someone with such a huge following. This statement was shared on Demi Lovato's Instagram, which has over 93.2 million followers, and the replies have been very positive, with one person saying the following, I'm glad that you're touching on this subject. The something that's important and needs to be talked about. The quicker people open their minds to the wonders of this world, the more easily we'll be able to move forward as one. Well, this person said this. This is a very interesting topic, but you're going to get people that will question you about it. I've read some of the replies and most of them are good, but there's a few people here calling you out and saying that you shouldn't be saying these things. I think this is wrong as we need to take this topic more seriously. People need to do their research and understand that there's bigger things than our world. I've tried this and it's tough to explain, but yes, it does work. Others have said that the issue with this topic is many people have been conditioned to believe one thing. So even if officials were to announce that UFOs were real, there would still be some that wouldn't believe it, because for their whole life they've been pushed to believe a certain idea. And when that idea is challenged, people struggle to move past that and open their minds. This isn't surprising either, and you can see why officials would hide this sort of information from the general public. It's clear that something is happening and that this topic has been studied much more than they're letting on. But as some have pointed out, what's the end goal? Why is this being kept a secret? Because surely, at some point, the truth will come out. One person said the following, One of the problems with keeping people in the dark is when you do eventually tell the truth. You're going to find it tough to convert those people's ideas. We all have tunnel vision to a certain level. The way we see the world is we apply human vision to it. And what I mean by that is we think if humans can't do it, it can't be done. We always imagine ourselves when thinking of these topics. So when someone sees a UFO, someone else might say it's impossible for that craft to travel at those speeds because we haven't done it yet. But there's more to the universe than humans. The universe is massive, too big for us to understand. So when it comes to these topics, human logic can't be applied. End quote. It's no secret that the universe is massive, and like some people have pointed out in the past, you would only need a planet to have started 100,000 years before us, and it could potentially be 100,000 years more advanced. Bearing in mind that 100,000 years is hardly anything when talking about the age of the universe, so they could be even more advanced. There's others, though, that just can't get on board with the idea of UFOs and other life forms. 
with them saying that it just sounds too unrealistic. But once again, is it unrealistic because we're applying what we think humans are capable of instead of looking outside of the box? Is it our beliefs that are holding us back? There's some that say we're never going to understand the universe. Many disagree that we're the only intelligent life in the universe. After all, scientists have come forward and said that within the Milky Way galaxy alone, there are billions of planets. And within the universe, there's billions of galaxies, meaning that there's hundreds of trillions of planets just waiting to be discovered. With this amount of planets and the fact that our small solar system holds life, there's even many scientists that have got on board with the idea that life exists on other planets. Regardless, this is a topic that will continue to interest many, with some saying they think that information will be disclosed to us soon. So what do you guys make of this topic? And Demi Lovato's comments? Do you think we're part of something much bigger? Or do you think we're alone in the universe? If you visit Thirsk, which can be found in North Yorkshire, England, you can visit a small museum. However, inside this museum is an object that's been at the center of many mysteries and has even caused people to leave the area and never return. The object that many people travel to see is that of a chair, which at the moment can be found hung from the ceiling. The reason that it's been placed here is because of the amount of complaints made with people saying that when they touched the chair bad things would happen. Interestingly, the museum has kept its promise and is keeping the chair up high so nobody would make the mistake of touching it and risk bad things happening to them. So why is the chair so feared? The story goes that the chair belonged to Thomas Busby, a local man who is known to cause trouble throughout the area. He lived in the North Yorkshire area during the 1600s. He married a woman called Elizabeth, but during their relationship, he would also get into trouble for petty crimes. There's also stories of his home containing secret passageways, where he would carry out illegal deals with some of the locals. One of these locals was known as a wordy, who turned out to be Elizabeth's father. Various stories have been told about the father's last day, but they all follow a similar theme. It's reported that Thomas and the father got into an argument and it was most likely about the business they were running. Locals reported that the two were often at each other's throats and could always be seen arguing. One thing that is known is that when Thomas entered his favorite inn, he was met with Alti and Elizabeth. The father said he was going to take Elizabeth away, something that didn't go down well with Thomas. Not only this, but he soon realized that Alti was sitting in his favorite chair. This caused him to pick him up and throw him out of the pump. He then took his life with a hammer. Because Alti was known around the area, people started to get worried when he didn't turn up at the local inn, with some fearing that something bad may have happened. It wasn't long before a search was carried out, in which Alti was soon found. It was said that soon after, Thomas was arrested. His trial soon started not long after being taken in, after which it was announced that he would be sentenced to death. The inn was soon renamed after Thomas Busby, being called the Busby Stoop Inn. Before he was sentenced, though, it's reported he was granted one last wish, and he wished that he could have one last drink in his favorite inn. As he was sitting in his chair looking around at the people, anger came over him, knowing that once he was gone it was likely that people would sit in his chair. Not wanting to live with this thought, he allegedly said that anyone sitting in his chair after his passing would be cursed. It didn't take long for the locals to report strange happenings in and around the pub, but the majority of these happened when someone sat in or touched Thomas Busby's chair. One report states that over 60 people have lost their lives after touching the chair. The first person to become a victim of the curse was that of a chimney sweeper. The year was 1895, and whilst they were having a drink, they decided to sit in the chair. It was reported that after they left the pub, they never made it home, being discovered the next day lying on the road. People suggested that their passing was due to them sitting in the chair. At this point, there started to be whispers of the chair being cursed, with some people even daring each other to sit in the chair to test the idea. The next people on the list were those of airmen. As mentioned, they would dare each other to sit in the seat until one of them would finally give in. At the time nothing happened, and they didn't think much of it, 
but all those men that sat in the seats never returned home from their missions, with the people that didn't sit in the seat returning. The next report was made in 1968, when the owner heard two airmen daring each other to sit in their seat. Both men ended up sitting in the chair, something that locals had warned them about. It seemed though it was too late as their fate had already been sealed. When driving home their car swerved off the road and hit a tree, causing both men to lose their lives. The next report was made in the 1970s, when the chair would take the life of a cleaning lady. After leaning on the chair, it was reported that she got a terrible headache. After going to get it checked out, it was reported that she had a brain tumor, something that had never been picked up before. She soon lost her life. Next up was a cyclist who sat in the chair while having a drink. As fate would have it, while cycling on a road, the man got involved in an accident, one that would take his life. The next was that of a group of builders who dared their youngest colleague to sit in the chair. Under the peer pressure, he did. However, while carrying out a job on a roof, he ended up going through it and losing his life. The chair had claimed another victim. After this, the owners started to notice that something was wrong and placed the chair down in the cellar so no one would accidentally sit on it. It seems though that the chair was conning as the delivery man had to place a parcel in the cellar and while doing so the postman sat on the chair. It had claimed another life as the man's van soon veered off the road. At this point enough was enough and the owners donated the chair in 1978 to the Thirst Museum where it hangs high so no one can sit on it. Various people have visited the museum just to look at the chair, and it's now become the main attraction at the museum. Paranormal researchers have said it's one of the world's most haunted objects. So what do you guys make of this chat? And do you think the curse is real? Throughout history, various paranormal stories have been told and it seems that the majority of these aren't one-off cases. Others have come forward in detail encountering similar things. One of the most common yet frightening entities has been called the shadow person. For many years, a number of people all around the world have reported waking up at night and seeing a mysterious shadow figure in their room. The shadowy figure has over time become famous, leading on to it being given a variety of different names, some of which include the shadow man, the hat man, and the shadow person. The phenomenon has gained widespread popularity and a number of documentaries have been made on the subject, trying to get to the bottom of what people are experiencing. However, it seems the more the subject is looked into, the more questions are put forward. The history of the hat man phenomenon goes way back in time, and different written records of the hat man have been found. In fact, some evidence of the hat man-like entity has been found in scriptures of previous civilizations, showcasing that whatever this thing is, it's been plaguing humanity for a long time. Some have gone on to detail that this entity would appear in the corner of a room, and that this usually happens while they're sleeping, and when they try to move or get away from it, they realize they can't. This is cool some to say this entity is evil. One woman has detailed her encounters with something mysterious. She shared her account with us, saying the following. We originally captured a voice on video while my mom was talking with my one-year-old son. The voice sounded like it said, come, come on, or something along those lines. Then we set up cameras and I called a priest. The priest came the same day when we set up the cameras. Within 24 hours, we captured several smoke videos, two additional instances where we heard a clear voice, and it said, I'm tired of you trying to get me out of this house and come see or come sleep, and orbs that when slowed down form the image of a man and a little girl. I called the priest back for a second blessing, and then we disconnected the cameras to avoid giving it any more attention or power. Before this started, my mom and I had been suffering from vivid nightmares and sleep paralysis, where I would see shadow man-shaped blobs, sleep hallucinations and voices calling you awake, and also feeling things. Lastly, my mother and I used to see the infamous shadow man in the hat when I was younger. This happened when I was around five. I'm now 35. My mother and grandma saw it while awake. Since we disconnected the video, I'm still having sleep issues and even hallucinating, hearing things like growling, name-calling, and loud buzzing noises, but I am seeing a sleep specialist and attributing it to REM disorder to avoid attention just in case. 
We don't know why it started, but my mother, myself, and my one daughter have always been sensitive and seen things such as shadow people during sleep awakenings. Before this started, we had enormous negative energy in the household and my sister tried to communicate with something, something that had a bad energy presence. That said, I've always been having horrible nightmares and sleep paralysis more frequently since I moved in here around a year ago. The previous owner had a daughter that was connected to a murder and we actually found a small witch broom in our attic a couple of weeks back with her name on it which we the true cause of what happened is a mystery and maybe a little bit of everything. As mentioned, this isn't the first person to come forward with their encounter. Others have detailed very similar things happening, especially when seeing the entity they call the shadow person. One thing that paranormal researchers can't seem to agree on though is what this entity is. Some people believe that Hatman is actually a mysterious entity that's haunted human beings for years and continues to do so in the present day. They believe that the Hatman tries his best to paralyze a person and even go as far as taking their life. However, when it fails to do so, the person lives to tell the tale. Interestingly, some tribes have described seeing a similar looking entity. One is that of the Canadian Inuit people who refer to this entity as Yukamunguric. This mysterious entity is known to paralyze humans with fear, and it seems to suck the breath right out of them. While scientific studies have found a phenomenon known as sleep paralysis, they fail to explain the appearance of the shadow figure. According to one theory, humans are most vulnerable when they're asleep, and when they're suffering from sleep paralysis, their brain plays a trick where they believe that someone is ready to harm them. However, there's no scientific evidence supporting this theory. Some people believe that the hat man is actually their own spirit and that it appears as a shadowy figure. They claim that when we're asleep our spirit leaves our body and sometimes when we suddenly wake up during the middle of the night, our spirit has not yet returned to the body and what we're actually seeing as the hat man is our own spirit. Another person detailed their encounter, saying that they've had nightmares their whole life and during many of these they've encountered the hat man, going on to say that this faceless being slowly makes its way towards them, and once it reaches the bed they then wake up, left scarred and confused about what happened. People like this who have encountered the hat man believe this is a real entity, and that its main goal is just to cause fear. There's certainly no shortage of shadow people stories, and there seems to be no consistency, with it affecting people from all over the world, and of all ages. So what do you guys make of this video? And have any of you experienced anything similar? Various cameras have been deployed in space that allow scientists and researchers to study and observe various things throughout our solar system, some of which include the SOHO camera that can be found close to the sun, and various cameras on the International Space Station that points towards the air. NASA's Heliovira cameras allow them to observe the sun, which is important to understanding its current behavior. Developed as part of the European Space Agency and NASA's Heliovira project, the Solar Heliospheric Observatory allows Inon to view its entire library. Over the years, it's provided some incredible photographs of our sun. However, some have noticed some strange anomalies in recent years, one of which has become known as the giant cube. I recently got sent this photograph by one of our subscribers, saying that they managed to capture the mysterious cube that was caught by NASA's SOHO cameras. They said the following about the object. I'm not really someone who's interested in these topics. I love astronomy and I love looking at live cams. However, I did notice that while looking through SOHO images, I saw this mysterious cube. One thing I find interesting is the size of the object. I have no idea what it is, but I thought you'd find this interesting. End quote. As with the majority of these findings, the individual is usually left confused. These objects aren't anything new and have been picked up by these cameras for years. Depending on who you talk to will depend on the explanation you get. For example, UFO believers are of the opinion that these cubes are related to the UFO phenomena and that every couple of weeks or so one of these giant objects is spotted. These discoveries soon get picked up by various websites, who all seem equally confused as to what the object is. 
Believers in the unknown have said it's strange how these objects are always seen around our with one researcher saying that the cube UFOs aren't really seen anywhere else. The most common place to see them is on the Soho cameras. However, other theorists have said that cube UFOs are nothing new and that this shape of UFO has been witnessed by people for years. These strange photographs have only caused people to speculate about what these mysterious objects could be with some putting forward the idea that the sun is a portal, and that these crafts come back every other week to use the sun's energy. It's important to note at this point that scientists are not impressed with these photographs and say these have nothing to do with UFOs and are most likely glitches or other types of camera anomalies. They point to the fact that sometimes when these images have been developed you can get these strange shapes that appear saying that they have nothing to do with unidentified flying objects and adjust processing errors that sometimes appear. Those that believe in UFOs though have said this explanation doesn't explain what's being seen, and that there's definitely something going on. One UFO researcher said the following, One of the problems is the size of these objects. They are easily several miles in diameter, and that immediately throws people off. But what I find interesting is how many of these alleged cubes are black in color. It reminds me of when you view restricted places on Google Earth. Sometimes they're blacked out so the general public can't see what's going on. This is what these images remind me of. It's as if NASA have placed a black cube here so you can't see whatever was there. I think the actual discovery is hiding behind these black cubes. And that they're just placed here to stop us from seeing the real object. End quote. As mentioned, some have suggested that these giant cubes are hundreds of miles in length, and that perhaps we should stop calling it our sun, as we may be sharing it. They go on to say that for years, mysterious objects have been seen in and around our sun, and with the increase of things like HD cameras and telescopes, people are able to capture them on camera a lot more easily. Those who have measured these types of objects have said that some of them are almost as big as our planet. NASA has provided an official explanation on their SOHO page. They said the following, Ever since launch there's been a number of people who've claimed to have seen flying saucers and other objects in SOHO images. Although some of the supposed pictures of UFOs can seem quite intriguing, they've always turned out to have quite an ordinary cause when examined by experienced SOHO scientists. Recently, we've been receiving so many questions and claims that we'd like to set the record straight. We've never seen anything that even suggests that there's UFOs out there. Most commonly, UFO claims are due to perfectly natural flaws or artifacts in our publicly available data. Some of the things that people are seeing are planets, cosmic rays, software glitches, and debris. Another NASA official said the following about these claims. The majority of these alleged UFO sightings can be easily explained. One of the things that people see is space debris that's made its way in front of their cameras. When these pieces of debris are up close it can look like an unidentified flying object. In reality people are just seeing a common piece of space debris. According to former NASA engineer James Oberg, he went on to say that these objects are just spaced down to our floating in front of cameras. When they appear in front of cameras they give off the effect that something much larger is there when in reality what people are seeing has a natural origin. He said the following, I've had enough experience with real spaceflight to realize that what's been seen in many videos is nothing beyond the norm, from fully mundane phenomena occurring in unearthly settings. Scientists don't seem phased by these discoveries and have said they will likely not comment on these types of anomalies anymore. But amateur researchers are of the opinion that there's something more mysterious going on. Space is one of the last unexplored frontiers for humans, and with that comes an air of mystery. There's many of us that want to believe that we're not alone, and that there's other intelligent life forms out there. But NASA have said that UFO researchers have it all wrong, and that there's never been any realistic UFOs captured on camera. It seems though that the government may be contradicting these statements, as recently they've released interesting videos showing UFOs and even saying comments like they've recovered off-world crafts. It would seem that the UFO debate is far from over. So what do you guys make of these cube images? And what do you think they are? This photograph is making the rounds on social media, 
showing a firefighter standing next to a statue of Christ. The story goes that a church in the Philippines caught on fire and tore throughout the building turning pretty much everything to ashes. However, as the firefighters were assessing the damage, they noticed that a statue of Christ seemed untouched, something that allegedly confused some of the firefighters. This photograph was taken and posted to social media, with many people saying that it was a miracle. One person said the following, This may be one of those photographs that you just scrolled past. Well, you should take a long look at this. It has a deep meaning. To me, this shows me that in times of hardship, there's always things that pull through. And in this case, God was showing humans not to give up. This is a sign that hard times will always happen. But look for the good. With another person saying the following, God is saying in the myths of fire he cannot be burned. He remains God and alive and all-powerful. Follow his footsteps and you'll be on the correct path. While this person said this, this wood did not burn because a divine power intervened. This is what miracles look like. They don't always have to be over the top. And this is a perfect example of God always being there. Sometimes they show you this in a subtle way. End quote. For many people, the photograph has been a somewhat beacon of light in what's fair to say is a dark time. Interestingly, there's many people that have said these kinds of events are not uncommon, and many of them are linked to religion. With some worshippers saying that all throughout history there's been various events that remain unexplained, going on to say that some of these have been witnessed by thousands of people. Additionally, many of these strange and mysterious religious events seem to point to the idea that perhaps our world is far stranger than we ever realized. One interesting story of a marine apparition is that of Our Lady of Warwick, in which the Virgin Mary was reported to have manifested overhead the Church of the Virgin Mary and Archangel Michael located in the city of Giza region. During the sighting, the first to view the event was that of neighbors across the street that reportedly saw a large orb of light hover over the dome of the church and slowly condense into that of the form of a female apparition. Given the previous sightings back in 1968, the event of Our Lady of Warwick that occurred in 2009 were quickly compared to the past sightings and was instantly believed to have been the return of the Virgin Mary apparition. Additionally, a high number of high-quality photographs were taken of the event that show in great detail a large glowing white, almost bluish light in the shape of a woman appearing over the dome of the church. Another interesting apparition is that of Our Lady of Zayton. Referred to by believers as the Our Lady of Zayton event, it appears that within the Zayton district of Cairo in Egypt, there appears to have been a mass sighting of the Virgin Mary, having manifested as a ghostly apparition above the Church of the Virgin Mary. Each time the apparition manifested, witnesses claim to have seen the shining image of the Virgin Mary, emanating like a pure white light and standing as a woman on the roof of the church looking out over the area. The first sighting occurred back on the 2nd of April in 1968 when a bus mechanic working across the street ran to the church, in the fear that he had spotted a woman about to jump from the roof. It wasn't long before the police were called and a crowd had gathered to try and figure out what was going on. The woman then began to glow a bright, blinding white light, and the police had to restrain people and hold them back to stop them from stepping on each other. As the sightings continued, more and more people began to gather around the church to also confirm what had been told only to also bear witness to the strange apparition manifesting before them and seeming to bear the resemblance and likeness to that of the Virgin Mary. Reports claim that over 250,000 people confirmed the sightings, with several pictures being taken of the event, showing a large glowing apparition standing on the roof of the church. Today, these marine apparition sightings and gathered proof continue to be ignored by skeptics, as no reasonable explanations have come forward. Believers have said that these apparitions are the real deal and show figures such as Mary and the reason they appear is to give hope when times are tough. Some skeptics though have hit back at these claims and say that people will see what they want to see and that there's no proof these are genuine. Interestingly though, many of these events do have photographs showing strange figures and also eyewitnesses that go into the thousands. One skeptic though said the following on a post on Facebook, when I read about these religious events that have happened, I find them interesting. One, because I want to believe. And two, because they sound so interesting. 
and it would be great if there was more to this world than what meets the eye. But I just don't think that any of them are real. For example, some of these just look like projections, something that's been around for a long time. I also think that some people need to believe in religion. There's many people out there that don't like the thought of there not being a god. For some people makes them feel safe in dark times. Some humans like to believe in God because it makes them feel like there could be something after we pass, instead of facing the reality that when our life is up, that's it. The inevitable is that as each day passes, our clock slowly comes to an end, and I think for some religion helps numb that pain. End quote. Many disagree with this though, and have said they've experienced things they can't explain. Whether that's voices when they're feeling down, or even in some rare cases being contacted by what some call a guardian angel. It's these encounters and experiences that solidify people's beliefs. So what do you guys make of this photograph? And do you think it shows a miracle? NASA have just announced they're going to hold a massive event. And during this, they will be releasing some major news about our moon. As of right now, the space agency is keeping the announcement under wraps, but they will be releasing the news very soon. Going on to say the following, it contributes to NASA's efforts to learn about the moon in support of deep space exploration. It's reported that this discovery has come from the Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy, also known as SOFIA. This SOFIA is an aircraft that has on board various instruments. NASA said the following in their announcement because the plane is able to get above 99% of the atmosphere's water vapor, which normally obscures our view of space, the flying observatory is able to pick up phenomena impossible to see with visible light. End quote. As of right now people have been giving their opinions on what they think the announcement will include, with many saying that it will most likely be linked to the upcoming moon mission. Recently NASA have announced they're working hard to try and get astronauts on the lunar south pole and they hope to do this by the year 2024. NASA is looking at putting the first woman on the moon within 2024. And a few months back, they said they're looking forward to getting the Trojan astronauts on the moon as soon as possible, but that they want to make sure that everything is working fine before they go ahead. One thing that NASA wants to do is to ensure as many tests as possible are being carried out before they go ahead and give the green light. The tests that the craft have been through have all been successful, and it does seem like if things keep going this way humans will be back on the moon by 2024. Some Facebook users though have gone down a different route, suggesting that NASA may have found life on the moon, or evidence that it once existed there. With one user saying the following, if there's life on Earth, is it really that unlikely that there's life on the moon? I've read stories that bacteria could be living there, and technically that's life. So would that count as aliens being on the moon? If not, perhaps it's something else. It's strange how they're making people speculate. End quote. Recently scientists have carried out a variety of tests on the moon. NASA officials and researchers have often attempted to theorize the contents of the moon, as well as its surface materials ever since the beginning of the space age, and efforts to retrieve lunar materials were made. There was hope that the moon would prove to be a far more capable, life-bearing body, as it's the closest celestial body to Earth. However, evidence retrieved from the moon after the original moon landings proved that estimates could not be more incorrect. Unlike our planet, the moon is not protected by a magnetic field of any kind, and is consistently bombarded by a significant amount of helium-3 as a product of solar wind radiation. It's this constant bombardment that would lead to the lack of any life-bearing developments on the moon of any kind, including any attempt at finding naturally occurring water on the surface of the moon. Oddly enough, however, recent satellite imaging has provided what the National Aeronautics and Space Administration has referred to as unambiguous data that shows evidence of large reservoirs of water on the surface of the moon. The satellite evidence published in the September 25th issue of the journal Science provided details that residing deep in lunar craters that are always shadowed from solar radiation, there are large pockets of ice that could store enough water to allow for the establishment of permanent lunar bases. The existence of these ice craters provides evidence that water molecules on the moon are incredibly mobile, allowing them to find their way to the craters in gathering at the bottom. 
In fact, planetary geologist Carl Peters said the following, If the water molecules are as mobile as we think they are, even a fraction of them, they provide a mechanism for getting water to those permanently shadow craters. Then this opens a whole new avenue of lunar research, but we have to understand the physics of it to utilize it. Not only does this discovery have profound implications for lunar research and planetary geology, but it also provides enough evidence and support for the establishment of lunar colonization and could see itself in use within the next few decades as NASA has been working on their Moon to Mars mission that will use the orbital satellite as a launching point for rocketry and further colonization of the Martian surface. NASA is at the forefront of space exploration. They've been vocal about how they want to carry on sending humans and robots into the cosmos, and that hopefully in the near future, we'll even have bases on the Moon and Mars. These missions have only inspired people to look to the stars and dream about the wonders that it holds. It's very likely that humans will land on the red planet within many of our lifetimes, with other space agencies saying they're looking at sending many of us to this planet. For example, SpaceX has announced their plans to send over 1 million people to Mars by 2050. Not only this, but they plan to build an actual city for these people, in the hopes that a new civilization can be started. This in turn has got a lot of people excited. Elon Musk stated in various tweets, the end goal is to get 1 million people on Mars within the next few decades, and he hopes that over 1,000 starships can be built to help him achieve this. He goes on to say that the goal is to be able to launch several of these starships a day so that trips to Mars can be open all the time. Elon went on to say the following needs to be such that anyone can go if they want, with loans available for those who don't have money. There will be a lot of jobs on Mars. So what do you make of this news by NASA? And what do you think the announcement is about? Do you think it has something to do with upcoming missions? Or do you think that NASA found something on the moon they're going to disclose? In the last 100 years, humans have managed to accomplish a lot. Space agencies have sent humans to the moon, sent high-tech satellites above our planet, and are now setting their sights on Mars, saying that within the next three decades they hope to put humans on the Martian soil. Perhaps though one of the most interesting things organizations are currently doing is hunting for extraterrestrial life. The European Space Agency, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, and NASA have been working very hard to find out if we're completely alone. Today we have a big number of projects that are made to scan the stars for signs of intelligent life. Despite our efforts, we've yet to make contact. Various theories have been put forward for what life could look like with some researchers even coming forward and saying that the human mind can't comprehend what's truly out there. One of the things that everyday people are now able to do is stargaze, with various companies offering high-power telescopes. These give everyday people the opportunity to see our nearby planets in much more detail. However, if you're not able to afford one of these telescopes, you can look through old NASA photographs. Some of the most interesting ones are those from the Apollo missions, but not for the reason you may think. When you think of the Apollo missions, you may think of Apollo 11, when humans first landed on the moon, which has been described as being one of the most impressive things that humans have done, showcasing what we can achieve when our best scientists come together. There's others, though, who have said that these photographs are hiding secrets, and one of these was taken during Apollo 17. This photograph was taken during the Apollo 17 mission with amateur researchers saying they think they've found an anomaly. It was Scotty Waring of UFO Sightings Daily website that made the discovery. He said the following, while exploring the NASA Parliament photos, I came across a photo that showed a black circle with slightly uneven edges like a crater. I found this odd since I could not see the bottom of the crater, but such black circle craters have been discovered before. When I looked at the photo right before and after this one, the object was no longer there. Instead of an opening, there was a lunar gray surface. The black hole was not visible. I knew from the past that there is a record on April 29, 2007, when an astronomer Alberto Mayo who lives in Italy saw and recorded a giant black circle that moved across the lunar surface. Then it changed direction at a right angle. End quote. Others, though, have gone against the idea of it being something mysterious and explained that it likely has a natural explanation. 
This person said the following, Whenever you see strange shadows, it's important to look at every possibility. The most likely answer here is that the shadow was caused by the Apollo equipment. Many of these Apollo photographs allegedly show mysterious shadows, but many of these are just the modules or other man-made objects. The reason these ideas are put forward is because some think the moon may not be natural, but rather is actually a base for otherworldly crafts. Before we carry on, it's important to note that scientists don't believe this theory, stating that there's no evidence to back this up. However, some have used previous studies to back up this idea. On November 14, 1969, in an attempt to better understand the makeup of the moon, NASA placed multiple seismic readers across its surface and then soon launched a lunar space module on a collision course for the moon. The idea behind this theory was to allow the lunar module to strike the moon with such a dramatic force that it would send specific frequencies throughout the entire core of the moon and allow the seismic readers to capture this data and help to accurately map out the inside of the moon. They soon discovered was baffling. Original theories and hypotheses have suggested that these reverberations would not last longer than a minute, given that the surface of our moon is covered in mostly basalt, of which would work to absorb these reverberations, and given its extensive presence, was believed to make up the majority of the mantle on the moon. It was mathematically calculated to prevent the seismic activity for lasting for a prolonged period of time. However, as the lunar module struck the moon, the entire celestial body began reverberating for over an hour. NASA scientists described its reverberation similar to that of a church bell ringing. Today, there is still no reasonable hypothesis for this cause, and no further information can be gathered given NASA's lack of future missions to the moon. The most legitimate theory available at this time comes from the works of Russian researchers Michael Vassin and Alexander Shabakov that had put forward the artificial theory. They began to notice that the craters of the moon, regardless of the impact size or diameter, all equaled out in depth. They also noted that these craters generally had very shallow and flat interiors, and in other areas even contained convex bottoms. They hypothesized that the meteors are hitting an armored hole underneath the basalt surface, preventing further depths into the celestial body, and believing the moon to be a possible spaceship created by complex alien life. This theory was only reinforced as the mathematics for the moon, and its density became an apparent issue. Given its size, location, and theorized general makeup, the moon should have a density of roughly 5.5 grams per cubic centimeter. However, given its orbital path and overall physics, we find the moon to only be 3.3 grams per cubic centimeter, causing the moon to be much less dense compared to that of our planet, despite theories of the moon's creation coming from the materials of the Earth. NASA said the following on their website. The entire moon rang like a gong, vibrating and resonating for almost an hour. The best guess was the moon was composed of a rubble a lot deeper below its surface than anybody had assumed. The internal structure being fractured instead of a solid mass could bounce the seismic energy from piece to piece for quite a while. End quote. Regardless, this idea is not backed by modern scientists, saying that our moon is very much natural and that there's nothing on there that points to there being life. So what do you guys make of these old Apollo images? And what do you think it shows? Aliens, outer space and flying saucers have been immortalized in 20th century pop culture, vividly portrayed in films, TV shows and books over the years. The potential existence of these extraterrestrial beings and spacecrafts have also sparked debate, as well as bringing up conspiracy theories about whether world governments are really telling us the whole story about alien encounters. However, when it's government officials themselves that things get scarily more real. So today, here at Unexplained Mysteries, we'll be taking a look at three stories where government officials have spoken about their knowledge of UFOs. Miyuki Hatoyama UFO Experience Miyuki Hatoyama, the wife of ex-Japanese Prime Minister Yukio Hatoyama, is a fairly interesting person in her own right. Alongside being married to one of the Eastern politics' biggest figures, she allegedly had a very close encounter with UFOs, as close as traveling to Venus with them. In 2009, she authored a book named Very Strange Things I've Encountered. Amongst a myriad of rather weird tales, 
one stood out as a lot stranger and perhaps a lot madder than any others. The otherworldly experience occurred some two decades before the book was published. In the book, she described a trip to the planet Venus under the abduction of aliens. She spoke of the experience and described it as, While my body was asleep, I think my soul rode on a triangular-shaped UFO and went to Venus. It was a very beautiful place and it was very green. Now this statement is a bit odd. This is because Venus is made up of mainly molten rock and has a temperature of some 500 degrees Celsius. You'd find it rather spectacular to see greenery on Venus in any form. Was this just her dreaming? Or was it a reality that she saw? Her account of this experience was a little eccentric with her description of what Venus looks like. However, the way Japan views UFOs and alien life are divergent. They think UFOs and alien life are more mystical and spiritual than scientific, and some Japanese politicians have admitted their belief in extraterrestrial life. Miyuki's experience may have been a little far-fetched, and perhaps was just the recount of a vivid dream she had. But the books did open up the UFO question once again in the Far East. Dwight D. Eisenhower's UFO Knowledge 34th U.S. President Dwight D. Eisenhower was many things to America. The mastermind of the D-Day evacuations, a pioneer of civil rights in the States, and the creator of the highway system. A five-star military general in his career in the Army, Eisenhower would have seen many things that no man wished to. At the same time, he was probably aware of many of the top-secret plans or documents including material that was discussed that was extremely sensitive, misunderstood topics at the time. Dwight D. Eisenhower allegedly had very good knowledge of UFOs, and he didn't just know about UFOs. Eisenhower, according to reports, actually met aliens three times. It's known that Eisenhower was extremely interested in the possibility of extraterrestrial life. Upon taking office in 1953, this didn't change. Only a year later Eisenhower's first infamous meeting took place. The president was on holiday in Palm Springs, California. According to his family, he simply disappeared for several hours one Saturday and missed a public dinner. He wasn't seen again until late the following morning. The White House Communications Department issued a statement announcing he had just chipped a tooth and had gone to see a dentist to get it fixed. But what Eisenhower was allegedly really doing was a lot more interesting and unnerving than a trip to a dentist. Michael Saller, who was an American university professor, wasn't convinced by the dentist's story. He believes that Eisenhower actually traveled to Edwards Air Force Base, and this theory does check out. The Eisenhower Presidential Library, where all the records from Eisenhower's presidency are kept, doesn't hold any record of the president visiting the dentist over the dates of the Palm Springs visit. Edwards Base is located in a barren yet impressive desert. It serves primarily as an active airport, but also houses an aviation museum. Perhaps its most famous function is acting as the administration center for none other than Area 51 itself. Sala believes that Eisenhower traveled to Edwards with some members of the Secret Service to meet with three extraterrestrial beings. They were known as Nordics in UFO circles due to their resemblance to Northern European or Scandinavian people. The aliens allegedly asked Eisenhower to denuclearize the United States as they were afraid of reckless behaviors that could endanger the space-time continuum and therefore affect the aliens themselves. In return, they offered their superior technological secrets to Eisenhower, as well as what the Washington Post described as spiritual wisdom, and the Edwards encounter was an only reported meeting between Eisenhower and alien life. In February 1955, around 300 people reported sightings of Air Force One landings in Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico. As Air Force One parked up, a man who was assumed to be Eisenhower descended the stairs. Suddenly, a group of what was thought to be flying saucers landed in front of the jet. What Eisenhower and the aliens discussed isn't exactly known. Some theorists believe he signed a treaty with them. Whether Eisenhower really did meet with aliens is up for debate. But if he did, it could throw all of America's potential UFO secrets up in the air. Dennis Kuznick has seen UFOs. Dennis Kuznick may not be very well known outside of the USA. For those of you that haven't heard of him, 
He was the former mayor of Cleveland and a U.S. representative from Ohio. He also ran for nomination as a Democratic presidential candidate in the 2004 and 2008 elections but didn't gain the vote on either occasion. But for some, his political endeavors don't outshine any of those personal experiences he had nearly 40 years ago. What was it that Dennis Kuznick saw hovering over actress Shirley MacLaine's house one night in Washington state all that time ago? Well, he confirmed it himself on national television in 2007, announcing that he had indeed seen a UFO, making himself seem a little mad and perhaps discrediting himself from the presidential race. He wasn't just being interviewed when he admitted seeing the UFO. He was actually partaking in a Democratic presidential candidate debate. However, the story behind this rather bizarre statement has some substance. In McLean's book, she wrote that one night, he was drawn outside by the smell of roses onto her balcony. She wrote that, when he looked up, he saw a gigantic triangular craft, silent and observing him. It hovered, soundless, for ten minutes or so, it sped away at a speed he couldn't comprehend. He said he felt a connection in his heart and heard directions in his mind. The connection between people and UFOs is actually quite well documented. Many people who have seen alleged UFO or alien life seem to have felt something just before, during or after the experience. The pair have been close for years, and Shirley MacLaine is known to be interested in UFOs herself. Funnily enough, Kazinik is personally against the use of weapons in space or using space as a weapon. His experience outside Shirley's house that night presents a more pressing question though. Might there be an ulterior motive behind his views on space weapons? And does this mean that the sighting was in fact real? Three interesting stories of government officials who knew a thing or two about UFOs, and not only did they allegedly know about such events, but some actually met these alien life forms themselves. We can imagine it would be quite terrifying to meet an actual alien. But at the same time, alien life has fascinated us for years. And ultimately, we all want to know what's out there. Do you believe in UFOs or extraterrestrial life? So what do you make of these thrilling stories about extraterrestrial life? This week, two celebrities have come forward in detail at the UFO encounters. The first one was Demi Lovato, who said that while being out in the desert, she used meditation to contact UFOs, even having proof as she took photographs of the craft. Many people came out and said it was good how such a high-profile celebrity was talking about UFOs. It now seems that Miley Cyrus has done the same thing. During an interview with US Weekly, Marley said she was once followed by an unidentified flying object. She said the following during the interview. I was driving through San Bernardino with my friend, and I got chased down by some sort of UFO. I'm pretty sure about what I saw. The best way to describe it is a flung snowplow. It had this big plow in front of it and it was glowing yellow. I did see it flying and my friend saw it too. Perhaps the most interesting part of the interview is when she said she made eye contact with the occupants. Going on to say the following. A being was sitting in front of the object. It looked at me and we made eye contact, and I think that's what really shook me. Looking into the eyes of something I couldn't quite wrap my head around. I was shaken for like five days. It really messed me up. I couldn't really look at the sky the same. I thought they might come back. Miley isn't the first person to have experienced something like this, and for years many people have come forward with similar kinds of encounters. Hynek scale is used to explain different types of interactions with UFOs. For example, a close encounter of the first kind is described as seeing an unidentified flying object less than 500 feet away. In this case, the individual is able to give a detailed description of the craft they saw, helping investigators to build a case around the encounter. This is what Miley's encounter would come under, and something that is surprisingly not uncommon. Every year across the United States alone, there are more than 8,000 annual reports of unidentified flying objects sighted all across the country, with several thousand more sightings made across the world, and countless more that have gone unreported out of fear of ridicule. Oddly enough, since the 1950s this annual number of UFO witness reports continues to grow every year, 
even pointing to evidence of a growing number of extraterrestrial visitations, or the cultural shift that allows more and more individuals to come forward and report their strange sightings without fear of being ridiculed by the public. A recurring theme surrounding that of extraterrestrial abduction stories is that many alien abductees are unaware of being victims of an abduction until therapeutic hypnosis allows them to unlock repressed memories seemingly knocked away from their conscious minds. This also appears to be the case with the witness account of Judy Doratry. According to Judy's case, back in 1973, four witnesses were traveling home to Texas City when they encountered a strange light that was described as hovering above them in the night sky. The four witnesses, Judy Daughtry, her daughter Cindy, Judy's mother and Judy's sister-in-law, all exited the car to get a better look at the strange hovering craft. The group of people claimed that it felt as if a long period of time had passed, despite having no recollection of the time. And shortly after this unexplained ton of confusion, the lights began to hover away and then disappeared into the distance. Immediately following the event, Judy and several members of the group began complaining of severe migraine headaches, generalized anxiety, and trouble sleeping following the encounter. After visiting a handful of doctors, all of whom believed the symptoms were most likely physical manifestations of stress, Judy visited Dr. Leo Sprinkle, a well-known neurologist, and trained hypnotist to activate her stress. Once under hypnosis, Judy began to uncover repressed memories of an alien abduction encounter that took place during the sighting that the four witnesses only made several weeks prior. According to Judy and later cooperated by her daughter after she'd also undergone hypnosis therapy, the four women were taken on the graft and witnessed two alien entities performing a series of surgeries and experiments. The event began as Judy claimed that while under hypnosis, she felt the impossible feeling of being in two places at once, as if holding conflicting memories of her standing outside the car and being taken up into the ship, as if the memories of her standing beside the car were implanted over her real memories of the abduction. She would also provide the additional statements surrounding their abduction and ascent into the craft. It's like a spotlight shining down on the back of my car, and it's like it has this substance to it. I can see an animal being taken up into this. I can see it squirming and trying to get free, and it's like it's being sucked up. End quote. The first experiments they witnessed was that of small entities cutting apart a cow and removing its organs for study. Throughout the experiment, the woman claimed that they would feel the thoughts and emotions of the small alien entities and could feel how robotic and inhuman they were. Judy herself claimed the alien creatures possessed no form of empathy and were merely curious creatures with no concept of emotional bias. Not even showing emotion when it came to the pain screams of the bovine creature during its examination, causing her own fear to grow that the alien creatures were capable of far more sinister actions without a consequence. Following the cow examination, Judy claimed to have seen her daughter being placed on an operating table as the aliens began taking a variety of samples. However, Judy nor the daughter go into details about what they mean by this or what they witnessed, with her only statement being the following. They don't listen. They just ignore me and go about their work as if it's nothing. They don't seem to have emotions. They don't seem to care. They just took some samples from her. End quote. Once the hypnosis therapy was finished, Judy's symptoms cleared up almost immediately, and she remarked that Normaki resumed back into her life, as her anxiety was nearly completely alleviated. Those skeptics have continued to deny her claims. All witnesses confirm each other's stories and leave behind a grave warning that visiting alien life is far more sinister, not because of some sadistic pleasure, but because they're far less human than anyone could imagine and will do whatever they want to satisfy their own curiosity even if such actions lead to the harm of those around them. What you make of Miley's claims and other similar reports. In every culture around the world, regardless of where they arose or what they believed, claims of demonic possession and hauntings are littered all across history. Researchers have said the majority of these claims stay under wraps, and the ones we hear about are only a select few with churches and higher officials not being honest about the possessions and the true intentions behind them. 
although such claims of entities might seem to be nothing more than the irrational fear of ancient man, in the modern day there continues to be reports of these evil beings. This has in turn caused some to question the true intentions of some priests, as a little digging will show you various groups in which people share their personal stories, and some of these go against the official church rules. Various nuns have come forward and talked about their time with the church. And one thing that is clear is that there seems to be no consistency. Some have stated their experience was great, and they felt closer to God than ever, while others detailed their experience was quite the opposite, causing them to feel more abandoned than when they first started. One sister was even thrown out of her congregation for trying to seek justice for a fellow nun. This sister explains that her nun came to her after having a very unpleasant encounter with the priest something it seems that is not uncommon. The sister said the shameful act should never have happened and that when they tried to seek justice it was immediately covered up, with her then being cast out. She goes on to detail that the priest would encourage these acts and that everything seemed backwards from what she thought things would be like. Nuns would be in relationship with priests sometimes out of choice and sometimes not. These types of stories are endless and it gives you an idea about how everything is not always as it seems. With another nun making the following statement, the very evils that plague this world happen inside of the church, my experience showed me that I was naive and far too trusting of people inside these walls. Although I didn't experience this myself, I heard stories of priests going against their religion and even worshipping the other side. This completely blew me away, but I found these weren't just one-off stories. Many people were coming to me and saying similar things. It changed my outlook on what I thought was something innocent. Things need to change, but until they stop suppressing this information and throwing people out for going against their beliefs, nothing will change. End quote. There's also the other side that deals with things like possessions, with insiders saying these are very much real and that the church takes them seriously. Perhaps one of the most famous and well-known cases is that of Anna Ackland, born in the state of Wisconsin on the 23rd of March in 1882. A girl named Emma Schmidt, and later given the name of Anna Auckland for the protection of herself, would become known for her possession, which happened at the age of just 14. According to gathered information surrounding birth records and U.S. Census data, Emma Schmidt was the daughter of two German immigrants, of whom came to the U.S. alongside other family members, of whom was said to have had ties to witchcraft and magical abilities. It was Emma's aunt who claimed to have cursed the young girl for reasons not entirely known. However, it's also believed that the aunt had a long-running affair with Emma's father, and this may have led to hatred from Emma from the aunt. By 14 years of age, the curse had manifested into a full demonic possession with claims that Emma began demonstrating complete revolutions of holy objects, uttering disturbing thoughts, and experiencing terrible fits of anger and pain when attempting to enter a church of any kind. On 18th of June, 1912, at 13 years of age, Emma Schmidt underwent an exorcism, and this was at the hands of Father Theophilus Resinger, a German Catholic priest from Bavaria. Though not much is documented of the event, and the demonic possession persisted long after this moment, until she was contacted by an exorcist once again nearly 20 years later. At 46 years old, after the passing of her aunt and father, Emma Schmidt was taken once again by Father Theophilus to the Ulling Convent, owned by the Franciscan sisters to undergo another exorcism alongside his colleague Father Joseph Steiger, of whom suggested extensively documenting the events that would follow. When Emma arrived, she was provided with food that had been sprinkled with holy water without her knowledge. As she went to take a bind, she broke into a terrible rage and was aware of the holy water without any supporting knowledge. The exorcism began the following day with the help of the sisters. They claimed that Emma had begun demonstrating supernatural powers throughout the exorcism, such as levitating, speaking in multiple languages she didn't know, howling in multiple voices in different pitches, and hanging from the doorway frame or the walls. As the exorcism continued for several months, Many of the nuns begged to be relocated to different convents, claiming that the supernatural evils of Emma were too much for them to handle. After nearly a year of the exorcisms and rituals, Emma fell on her bed and screamed out the names of every spirit believed to have been possessing her, which included Bilzebub, Judas, 
Jacob her father and Mina her aunt. She regained lucidity and claimed that she'd been freed of the spirits and immediately began praying to Jesus Christ. After the last ritual, Emma Schmidt would have no more symptoms of possession of any kind. It seems that this is just one story in a long list, with many of them following a similar theme. Someone that has completely changed personality and is able to speak multiple languages and displays supernatural strengths. Researchers have claimed this has been going on for hundreds of years and that the majority of these ancient stories are rooted in fact. As the years go on, perhaps we'll find out more information about these cases and what happens within convents throughout the world. So what do you make of these stories and some of the stories that have come out in recent years? Do you think there's other things the church is hiding? These stories fascinate many of us. They open our imagination and for a brief moment, take us away from the stresses of everyday life. Some of these stories cause us to carry out research and what's interesting is in some cases some of these are based on real events. This allows us to connect to the story more as it stops being fiction and moves into the realm of reality. For years, stories have been told to us that include mythical creatures, and although there's some that say these don't exist, there's others that believe otherwise, saying that the stories that have been passed down are actually rooted in reality. Over the years, many have come forward with their encounters, detailing impossible-to-explain creatures that are said to only exist in fiction. However, these individuals stick by what they saw, saying that we share our planet with mysterious creatures. Some of the most interesting stories are those that involve the ocean, and this is because the ocean is so vast, and every year researchers and scientists discover thousands of new species, showcasing just how little we know about our planet's oceans. One of the most interesting creatures that humans have allegedly witnessed is that of aquatic humanoids, also commonly known as mermaids. One of the issues with the majority of these cases is that it's tough to pack them up. But enough people have detailed their encounters that cryptid researchers consider them very much real. One interesting story was told by a user on Reddit. However, the story has since been deleted by the original user. One person got in touch though and told me about the encounter. They said the story goes that a woman was talking to her father about the mysteries of the oceans and they got onto the topic of cryptids. Her father worked for the U.S. Navy and started to open up about some of the mysterious things they'd witnessed. The father went into detail about how the ocean is very eerie, and that while out in the middle of it he would hear and see strange things. One of the things he said was that he would often hear whistles and voices, something that to this day he couldn't explain. The daughter then said her father traveled to the Philippines. And it was here that he was told about some of the local legends. It said he got talking with one of the local women, and she went on to tell him a story of the time she encountered a mysterious aquatic humanoid. She described the creature as being seven feet in length, possessing two large black eyes, large webbed hands that had claws, a humanoid-like body, and a face that she described as looking like a demon. The encounter happened while she was on a boat. As she was coming home, she heard a loud knock and knew she'd hit something. She said that sometimes this happens, and in most cases it's either litter that's made its way into the ocean, or trees and other debris. But as she leant over she saw two large black eyes staring back. She said she let out a loud scream and quickly left, not wanting to stay in the area with the unknown creature. The father was fascinated with the story and couldn't understand what this woman witnessed. He then decided to do a little digging and see if anyone could shed some light on the mysterious creature. When he then asked around about this mysterious creature so he didn't get the response he expected, instead of being laughed at or mocked, he was actually firmly shut down, being told not to ask those sorts of questions. This only caused him to become more interested in the topic and go on to do his own investigations. Although he never pursued it while at work, he said he spent countless hours doing research on the topic and that these stories of aquatic humanoids may be real. When the daughter asks whether he thinks the Navy are aware of these animals, he paused and said he thinks they might be. Going on to say that there's many divisions within the Navy, they investigate things such as unidentified objects and also strange things seen in and around the oceans. 
Scientists have said there's no such thing as mermaids and that no solid evidence has been discovered that points to their existence. Regardless, stories continue to be told about these mysterious human odd creatures, with some even saying that they've seen the creatures themselves. Believers point to the fact that the majority of our oceans have not been explored, and until every part of it has been mapped out, we can't say for sure that these elusive creatures don't exist. One place that's faced a problem with these alleged creatures is that of Zimbabwe. The mermaids of Zimbabwe have been a recurring problem for those living near large waterways in the country, as the creatures have reportedly been at the center of a variety of random attacks. Back in 2012, while working on dams, a Zimbabwe construction company claimed that nearly every employee had left the construction site in fear for their lives after having been attacked by a strange humanoid river monster known as the Mambamantu. It was believed that the Mambamantu used the rivers as natural outlets to the ocean and that they had become angered by the construction. Debates were made on whether or not construction should continue before a full report on the environmental impact was made. It turned out that under pressure of contracts and health standards, construction continued regardless. This forced the local council to hire entirely new workers from out of the country to work on the dam, as the locals refused to continue working on the construction of the projects due to their superstitions. Oddly enough, after several weeks, these other workers resigned after claiming to have been attacked by humanoid sea creatures and regarded the entire river as being cursed. Not everyone is convinced though, with skeptics saying these make for good stories, but there's no proof of them. Saying that if there was a large enough population of these underwater humanoids, how come no remains have ever washed up on beaches? And how come there's no high quality photographs of them? Believers though have said the oceans break down their tissues, leaving nothing to be washed up. As mentioned though, scientists and researchers have said there's no solid evidence to back up these claims. And the most likely explanation is that people are seeing everyday wildlife. One theory that's put forward is people are seeing creatures like manatees or even other humans. Under certain conditions, animals like manatees can take on a different look, especially if it's dark and the visibility is ingrained. There's still those that believe these stories and go back to the point that much of our ocean is still unexplored. So until we've explored every region they say we can't completely rule out that these creatures don't exist. So what do you guys make of these stories that have been told in various places around our planet? Do you think they're real? Or are they just people misidentifying everyday wildlife? Nature can be inspiring and help you find yourself with its overwhelming beauty. Annually, countless people travel to national nature, reserves where nature reigns supreme in the hopes of grounding themselves or for the sake of sightseeing. Nature is breathtaking, but it can be deadly. It's easy to end up alone in the vast unknown, where your calls for help may go unheard. Missing persons cases have been occurring at national parks for decades. It's expected for hundreds of people a year to vanish in the wild woodlands. With luck, their body might be found and laid to rest. But this isn't the case for the majority of those who disappear. So today, here at Unexplained Mysteries, we'll be taking a look at three national park mysteries. Something in the background. Dundas Peak in Canada is an alluring tourist attraction. Its stunning viewpoint overlooks Hamilton City and is a glorious sight to behold. The splendor of colors all around the peak is enough to soothe the restless souls who want to visit it. The destination is particularly popular in the fall. When the leaves turn from green to rusty hues of red and yellows, casting a spell of beauty over the national park, 140,000 tourists came to Dundas Peak in 2016. One of those tourists was a woman by the name of Kim. She wished to recreate some photographs her cousin had taken months prior. The trip was a light-hearted one with Kim and her friends, who set up their photography equipment around the peak with a desire to take a few panoramic shots. It was when something flashed with light in the camera that Kim noticed something on a just above a gorge. With intense curiosity, she reached out to get what she realized were a set of keys dangling on a branch. She was concerned they would fall and leave someone stranded without their car. 
she reached out and managed to obtain the keys for a Hyundai. Once the sun began to set and the twilight sky illuminated the famous peak, the group decided to head back to their car and return home. As beautiful as the park was, they didn't want to stay there after dark. The group was one of the last hikers to leave the area for the night. It was only then that Kim noticed that Hay and I were still parked in the car park. The car, according to Kim, was visibly filthy and hadn't been used in a long time due to how run down it looked. The group decided to return home, not wanting to wait pointlessly until it got pitch black for the owner to appear. So Kim placed the keys on the roof and hoped the owner would find them. Days later, a police report declared a woman had gone missing in the Dundas Peak area and that the car belonged to her, left to the Ruth bus element as its owner had disappeared. The Reddit user, who claimed to be a friend of Kim's, shared the pictures they had taken at the peak, alongside the ones taken by Kim's cousin. The Redditor realized there was something eerie hidden in the background of the cousin's photos and sought the help of Reddit to help him figure out an explanation for what they were seeing. In the background of the image stood an unnaturally thin humanoid figure, dressed in gray with no visible face. The mysterious figure doesn't appear in any other photographs taken at the peak. Kim attempted to disprove the claims that they were just a brave hiker. However, the spot this humanoid figure was spotted in was completely inaccessible. The description of the missing woman fit the appearance of the ghost-like figure perfectly. Countless people have gone missing in the area within the past several decades. Some people suggest the figure was the forlorn, restless spirit of the unfortunate hiker who met her doom in the wilderness of the peak. Still, many others argued it to be a trick of the light, melting ice, or an illusion. In the end, no one can truly say for certain what they found in that photograph. But what is for sure is the fact they may have lost their lives to the unknown forces that dwell between the trees. Mysterious case of Zhang Hyunwin. It's unfortunate how many people fade into obscurity as a result of a simple whim to see the beauty of nature. Most of those placed on missing lists are rarely found alive, if at all. Regardless, even the coldest of cases remain open, even if they're not active. Generally, a cold case can be reopened if there's any sufficient evidence or a valuable tip of a person's whereabouts, passed away or alive. This particular case happened on September 17, 2017. An Asian man by the name of Zhang Hyung went missing in the Grand Canyon, Arizona. He left behind his white Toyota at the Moran Point of the Grand Canyon National Park, which was found on the very same day of his mysterious disappearance. The car had been spotted close to the New Hans trailhead before he was reported missing. At the time, Mr. One was 45 years old and described as 5 feet 7 inches in height and is weighing 121 pounds. As far as authorities are concerned, he lacks any in-depth personal plans for his visit to Arizona, other than to visit the Grand Canyon and go sightseeing. There's a lack of further information regarding him, which only serves to make the cold case harder to solve. Unfortunately, when it comes to the missing souls of national parks, it's usually safe to assume that hikers have succumbed to their elements. After several years had passed due to the improbability for long-time survival, a user on Reddit commented that Zhang Yun probably passed away due to insufficient resources. Many hikers lose their lives due to overconfidence and underestimation of how much food and water they'll require during their adventure. Another Reddit user explained there's a river at the canyon that has sediment at the bottom, due to the forces of physics sucking their bodies below the surface. It's as good a theory as any as to what fate befell him. The disappearance of Kieran Burke. Kieran Burke has been missing since the 5th of April, 2000. Burke was a citizen of Ireland, from Dublin, who decided to go on a two-week vacation to San Francisco. During this vacation, he made the decision to see the Yosemite National Park in California, which was, and continues to be, a popular tourist destination. Burke made reservations at a hotel near the National Park from the 4th of July, 2000, to the 6th of April. If Fortuna had been on his side, perhaps he wouldn't have mysteriously vanished without a trace on Wednesday the 5th of April. He was seen for a final time in Yosemite Valley at Cary Village. 
He was about to set off on a day hike and left behind him a grieving wife and three children and a plethora of mourning family members back home in Ireland. The man was wearing a bomber jacket and has been described by those who knew him, including his brother, as an adventurous spirit who adored hiking. This was allegedly not Burke's first long hike. He was said to be experienced in the hobby having hiked the Himalayas. But perhaps this wasn't enough experience to withstand the dangers of Yosemite National Park. Burke's rental car was found at the Curry Village, seemingly abandoned. It was only six days after the disappearance that the search began on April 11, 2000. The search was said to be extensive and tedious, but no evidence nor trace turned up. His brother, Lorcan Burke, traveled from Ireland to help with the investigation, but the case was luckless, leaving it cold for the next 20 years. After all this time, not a single clue has been found as to his whereabouts, body, or potential lot of life. Christine Cowes, a spokeswoman for the Park Star, explained, they were notified by the hotel when he didn't check in on the 6th of April. The only thing found was his tent, still filled to the brim with his possessions. Christine explained to the public that Yosemite has 800 miles of trails, which made the search for Burke painfully difficult, since he could have been anywhere. The possibilities are limitless, she stated at the time of the investigation. The weather further disrupted the search due to a drastic change in weather. From warm sunshine to horrid thunderstorms, this brought snow and rain, which erased any traces of where he may have gone. Twenty years have come and gone, and the case still remains cold. It's easy to forget how fragile our lives are, or how overpowering the strength of nature can be. We live in a digital world, filled with order and self-imposed safety. Though nature is rewarding and worth exploring, it's crucial to remember that we're a powerless part of it. We cannot control nature, and you should always be prepared by bringing enough survival resources. So what do you make of these national park mysteries? The Great White Shark goes by different names, from the Great White to White Pinder. This giant predator is a carnivorous animal that feeds on sea turtles, fish, seabirds, sea otters, seals, and cetaceans. It's also a greatly misjudged animal, with films and documentaries portraying the creature as one that preys on humans. This couldn't be further from the truth. Although it holds this record, the reason humans get attacked by great whites is because they mistake us for their natural prey. The great white shark can consume several kilograms of food in a single bind and is often captured on camera taking down large seals. Aside from orcas that really go after younger great whites, this giant shark does not have any other natural predator. From research made in 2014, great white sharks have a life expectancy of around 70 years. These sharks can be found in practically all coastal and offshore waters, with temperatures ranging between 12 and 24 degrees. Researchers have discovered that female great whites are larger in size than their males, with the males having a length of 3.4 to 4.7 meters and an average weight of 520 to 770 kilograms while the larger female has a length ranging between 4.6 to 4.9 meters and weighing between 680 to 1,100 kilograms. With that being said, though, people have reported much larger great whites, with some great whites reported reaching lengths of 6 to 7 meters. One well-known great white is known as deep blue and is said to measure in at just over 6 meters. Great white sharks often seen around the coastlines of America, South Africa, and Australia. But in recent years, people have claimed to have seen them off the coast of England. One of my subscribers sent me this photograph, allegedly showing a great white shark off the coast of Devon. The photo was screenshot from an app called Osearch. On their website, they state the following, Osearch is a data-centric organization built to help scientists collect previously unattainable data in the ocean. End quote. They tag and track sea creatures such as sharks and turtles, with one of their main focuses being great wines. But this one seems to show a great white shark very close to Devon in England. Interestingly, this isn't the first time this conversation has come up, 
as various fishermen around Devon and Cornwall have reported seeing great wines and state they're definitely swimming in our waters. One fisherman in Devon reported that he's had other fishermen come to him and tell him stories of great wines. And the descriptions of these sharks only match that of the great white. Ashley Lane, who's known to take people out on fishing trims, said that he thinks great whites are in our waters. He said the following, there's more than likely great white sharks out there, mainly off the Cornish coast, but I've heard nothing so far this year. We usually hear more rumors. We've seen a few pods of common dolphins with juveniles in the bay, and there are definitely tuna swimming around too. I think species like this swimming off the coast of Devon would be great, and definitely good for my trade. People would love to see that sort of thing, but you're then baiting wildlife which interferes with the ecosystem. They're not pets and shouldn't be treated as such. End quote. Dr. Ken Collins from the University of Southampton said the following, It's likely we'll be seeing more sharks spread from the warmer regions, such as the Mediterranean Sea towards our waters in the UK over the next 30 years. These include things like hammerheads, black tips, and sand tigers, which are currently found swimming off the coast of Spain and Portugal. Though while the potential number of shark species around the UK may increase in the next few decades, the overall number of sharks, especially the bigger ones, will fall as a result of overfishing, plastic waste, and climate change. It's really important we work together to prevent a premature extinction of these wonderful creatures. End quote. This fisherman had this to say, I fish off the coast of Devon and I've seen great wines. They're definitely not common. But I'd say I'm 99% sure I've seen a great white. This shark was around 4 meters long and had the general build of a great white. They are not hard to mistake and they stand out, especially in British waters. We have no other shark with the same appearance. The only other thing we have is basking sharks and it definitely wasn't that. End quote. Whether great white sharks will be calling British waters home anytime soon is up for debate. But local fishermen stand by what they believe and say that there's definitely great white sharks in British waters. Shark conservation is important. With hundreds of millions of sharks losing their lives every year, it's a subject that needs more attention. One way scientists learn about sharks' behaviors by tracking their even this has now become a controversial subject. There's many that state that tagging doesn't benefit the shark in any way and can actually lead to their demise. Some wildlife experts have said that tagging a shark can put them under a lot of stress and even cause things like infections. Sharks are gentle creatures and don't act well when under stress and this is one of the reasons why you don't see great white sharks in aquariums. Process of tagging them seems quite straightforward, but shark groups have listed the many things they go through and that each of these are bad for the shark's overall condition. Firstly, they're placed on a deck. Then they have hoses placed in their throats something that sometimes damages the gills. The stress can also be overwhelming, which is why when they're placed back into the ocean, sometimes they slowly nosedive to the bottom, something that researchers have said isn't a good sign. Important that we protect our oceans and the many animals that live within it. Sharks have been swimming in our oceans for over 400 million years, meaning they've outlived other incredible creatures such as the dinosaurs. But wildlife experts have said we need to step up and start protecting these creatures. Not only because they've been taken out at an alarming rate, but also because they help maintain a healthy ecosystem. So what do you guys make of the claims that great white sharks are in British waters? And do you believe the story is told by local fishermen? The human body is both remarkably resilient and yet surprisingly fragile. When we spend the winter sheltered indoors and the summer covering ourselves in sun cream, it can be hard to remember just how impressive the human race can be. These stories of people who made it through incredibly horrific situations will leave your mind blown as to the extreme conditions they were able to fight through. So today, here at Unexplained Mysteries, we'll be taking a look at three incredible survival stories. Icebox survivors in 2009, an Australian Coast Watch plane was conducting its usual checks when the pilot saw something a little out of the ordinary. Two men floating at sea in an icebox. Two Burmese men, both in their twenties, were found to have been floating out at sea for 25 days, 
with only each other and an icebox. In December of 2008, a group of 19 men had gone fishing in a 12-meter Thai fishing boat. When the group were, as estimated by the men, 200 miles north of Australia, the wooden fishing boat began to break apart in the sea's rough water. Although the group was much larger, sadly these two men are thought to have been the only survivors, as whilst others struggled and failed to grasp something to allow them to stay afloat, these two men were able to climb in the five-foot by four-foot icebox described as desk-sized. An Australian Maritime Safety Authority spokeswoman elaborated and explained that without flotation devices it is highly unlikely anyone could have survived 25 days, nearing a month in such harsh conditions, meaning no search was conducted for the other individuals aboard the fishing boat. When recounting their brave story, the men mentioned the fishing boat having sent out distress signals before it broke apart, but these were met with silence and no response. When the boat inevitably split, all members of the crew were frantic in aiming to grab a hold of something, purely to stop themselves from drowning. The men also spoke about seeing another crew member pass them by, too far away to help them into the icebox too. Throughout the course of the month, these heroic men believed that numerous ships saw them and yet no attempt was made to come to their aid. Though Tracy Jiggins has mentioned during interviews that being of such a small size in such a vast space, these men were highly fortunate to be spotted. Were their pleas ignored or unheard? The men had an unpredictable and perilous journey, floating through the sea during monsoon season and where there had been recent cyclonic storms, with just an icebox for safety. The pair had no choice but to follow the tide as this was all that could guide them through though the men drifted hundreds of miles in the icebox. They feared each day that rough waters would result in them being tossed from the box, leading to them to meet the same fate as the rest of their fishing crew. It is thought that the men managed to survive by drinking rainwater that had collected in the bottom of their icebox, and eating bits of fish from within the bottom of the container as the icebox had been used to keep the caught fish fresh during the initial fishing trip which had been completing regular checks for illegal immigrants or fishermen illegally entering Australian water, spotted the two men waving their shirts to signal for attention. Upon seeing the pair in such distress, a rescue helicopter was promptly called in order to bring the pair to safety. The men were spotted across Torres Strait, which lies between Australia and Indonesia. The rescue helicopter, piloted by Terry Gadden, commented that the men's first words upon could we have a drink? When talking on the matter, these triumphant survivors said, we are so glad you found us. We couldn't have lasted much longer. These poor men, despite finding eventual success and safety, floated for a month across shark-infested seas with scraps of fish and rainwater to survive off. A true testament to the human world. William and Simone Butler Husband and wife William and Simone Butler embarked upon a sailboat journey in 1989 that quickly spiraled into disaster, leaving the pair struggling to survive at sea for 66 days. The couple's sailboat, Sibony, was smoothly sailing whilst the couple slept when they were awoken by a thudding sound. William went to investigate and saw dozens of whales in the moonlight. One whale crashed into the port side with significant force, and when the pair heard gushing water, they knew this whale attack had caused a leak. Despite the pair's prompt attempts to get rid of the water and fix the leak, the water had filled the ship to waist height within mere minutes. Taking quick and decisive action, the pair inflated the life raft and collected as many essentials as they could gather, leaving with cans of food and bottled water to survive off. Perhaps more importantly, the pair escaped with a desalination, making salt water safe to drink. Blankets, a compass, a torch, knife, line, and hook to fish, and a Walkman also made it into the raft. While the Walkman may seem like a random choice, occasionally the pair could pick up radio stations from LA, Texas, Guatemala, Costa Rica, and Panama, giving some kind of context to the pair as to whereabouts they were. Within just 15 minutes, Sibony, the butler ship, had sunk. The pair rationed their food, though it only lasted for four weeks of their 66 day journey. This remains impressive when you consider the limited supplies they had. William and Simone didn't have a great deal of luck fishing, to the point that William reached into the water and grabbed a turtle with his bare hands, some of which they ate and some they saved for bait. Throughout their journey, 
the couple had to kick away approaching sharks, protecting themselves from multiple attacks, from which the pair struggled to keep water out of. Whilst the hole was blocked, the raft was never quite the same, adding the additional challenge of keeping the raft afloat. Over the course of the butler's dangerous trip, the pair signaled to numerous ships, who simply overlooked the raft, with it being too small to be spotted. Their daughter, Sally, had alerted the U.S. Coast Guards, but there was no search for the couple. William and Simone were found by a Costa Rican Coast Guard 30 miles off of the coast of Golfito. The pair were found purely through luck, but were saved and made a steady recovery. Each of them had lost over 50 pounds and struggled with injuries from attempts to fish with their hands from the sun and from the lack of food. William had wanted to sail around the world since he was a young child, and that was the intent when the couple embarked upon this adventure. Simone was reluctant but agreed to join him. Whilst what the pair went through was truly awful, Simone mentioned that the experience made them turn more strongly to their Catholic faith, and William stated, the Pacific can be very unfriendly, followed up with, from now on, I'll be staying in the Atlantic. So it is safe to assume this incident has not deterred William from his passion. These survivors have a remarkable tale to tell, and while they made a steady recovery, the unforeseen twist of a whale attack was not what they had been hoping for. Toakai Taito lost at sea the Kiribati fisherman and father of six, Toakai Taito, was lost at sea for 15 weeks in 2012, after sailing to a swearing-in ceremony where he was named a policeman. The journey home should have taken just two hours, but instead he was lost in the Central Pacific for three and a half months. He credits the help of a shark for being found and rescued. Taito had begun his two-hour journey home with his brother-in-law sailing in their wooden boat when they happened to fall asleep. Within this time, the boat had floated further out into the sea. Land was no longer visible and the pair had run out of fuel. Initially, food was not an issue, though the pair did not have anything to drink. Unfortunately, on July 4, 2012, Tato's brother-in-law tragically passed away from dehydration. To honor him, Tato slept beside him, but he had to continue his journey. Tato ate fish and drank rainwater to survive. The story takes more of a bizarre twist, however, when on September 11, 2012, Tato was awoken by a six-and-a-half-foot-long shark circling his boat and bumping the hull. Tato believes this was the shark indicating the direction for Tato to travel where Marshall Island's fishing vessel was seen and able to rescue Tato. When the shark cast Tato's attention towards the vessel, he could see the stern of a ship and a crew that had clearly spotted him. The shark then swam away, causing no harm. Tato says that the shark saved his life and that next time he has to make a trip, he will catch a plane. These survival stories are truly impressive. When humans are left in such perilous situations, we are forced to rely on wit, the perceptiveness of others, and more than a little luck. But what do you make of these survival stories? Ed and Lorraine Warren are probably the most famous ghost hunters in history. They referred to themselves professionally as paranormal investigators and demonologists. They were propelled into the spotlight throughout the later 20th century due to their investigations into high-profile ghost cases. The pair investigated the Enfield haunting in London, England, the Annabelle Dole case, and the famous Amityville horror in the suburbs of Long Island. The Warrens may have been prominent in America, but weren't household names across the globe until 2013. This was when they were portrayed in the film The Conjuring. The film, inspired by paranormal cases investigated by the Warrens, have grossed over $1 billion worldwide. The issue with horror films, though, is people like to think they aren't real. But Ed and Lorraine Warren were both real people, and they even owned their own occult museum in Connecticut. Since this point, they've both now passed, but their ghostly legacy lives on. So now, here at Decover Eyes, we'll be taking a look at three of the most haunted objects. In the Warren's spooky occult museum, the Shadow Doll, Dolls. Ed and Lorraine Warren and creepy stuff locked away in a haunted museum all seem to go hand in hand. Dolls are meant to be innocent fun things, something you would give to your children when they're young, and these toys would provide endless entertainment. 
but horror and the horror genre tends to take the ordinary out of ordinary objects. Dolls often fall into that category. The Warrens may be best known for the Annabelle doll, which sits in this day in a glass cabinet, left twice a week by a priest. However, we're going to be looking at a different doll housed in the Warrens Occult Museum. The Warrens kept a shadow doll in their museum and it's really quite terrifying. The doll wears black robes with the same colored hair that replicates feathers. Its mouth sits open and it has tiny creepy eyes that seem to be burned into its plastic face. The shadow doll in the Warrens Museum has a blurred history. They don't state why the doll was created, but they do know it was allegedly created using black magic. Used in satanic rituals over the years, the doll was bought by an anonymous couple some time ago. However, after the couple began to experience eerie and unexplained phenomena, they started to fear the doll had brought some sort of dark medium or spirit into their lives. And it wasn't long before they realized that since they bought the doll, they'd begun to experience the same unearthly and horrifying dreams about it. Despite the couple's strange experience, however, they seem to have got off rather lightly. You see, the shadow doll is quite literally a nightmare. It's rumored that taking a photo of the doll and passing it on to someone somehow etches the doll into their brain. There, it causes such horrendous nightmares that allegedly people end up having heart attacks out of pure fear. Exactly how the Warrens got their hands on this doll is still unclear, but it remains in the museum behind a glass cabinet to this day. We think it's better that it's there than out in the open world. The Borley Rectory Brick Borley Rectory was built in 1862 for the rector of the village of the same name. The village sits on the Essex-Suffolk border and the house stood until 1944. Now you may be wondering why the house is no longer there. English villages are full of buildings constructed 100 of years ago. So what happened to the Borley Rectory? The rectory was constructed on the site of its predecessor, which burnt down in 1841. Borley wasn't your typical huge manor house, the type that ghosts seem to enjoy haunting. The house had more a gothic-style, modest rectory, but alas, it became a spook magnet quite quickly. In fact, it was only a year old when the first paranormal activity was reported there. The rectory stood undisturbed for around 40 years after that, but it proved not to be the last. In 1900, the rector's four daughters reported seeing a nun on Borley grounds. This sparked several reports of sightings on the rector's grounds by villagers, including rumors of a phantom, headless horsemen running rampant around the house. The rector passed away in 1927 and was replaced in both the church and in the house by the Reverend Guy Smith. Smith moved in with his wife and it's unknown whether they were aware of the house's ghostly past. One night, the Reverend's wife was cleaning out an old cupboard in the house when she came across a brown package. It was oddly shaped and when the wife opened it, a skull was revealed. Naturally, she was shocked and the terrifying surprises didn't end there. For some time, Reverend Smith and his wife experienced poltergeist activity, such as light flickering, footsteps, and other unexplained phenomena. They called in paranormal investigators and the incident got extensive coverage in the Daily Mirror newspaper, but no conclusion was reached by the time the Smiths left Borley in 1929. The penultimate family to inhabit Borley Rectory was the Foisters. This was with Reverend Lionel Foister and his wife and daughter. They moved in in 1930. They too experienced poltergeist activity, but on a more serious level than the Smiths. The Foister didn't last as long at Borley and six years after moving in, it was empty once again. Borley Rectory was eventually destroyed in a fire, which many think was deliberate by the house's last owner. Captain W.H. Gregson. Once the flames were put out, investigators found bones believed to be of a young woman in the basement, perhaps those of the skulls found by the Smiths. So what does this have to do with the Warrens in their museum? Well, Ed and Lorraine bought a brick from the Borley to the museum as some kind of weird demonic souvenir. The brick stays there to this day, serving as a reminder to history and what has been described as England's most haunted house, the Warrens Dolls. The shadow doll isn't the only doll in the Warren Occult Museum. One doll simply couldn't suffice. The couple collected a plethora of artifacts, ranging from African tribal masks used in rituals to alleged vampire coffins. 
However, as we spoke about earlier in the video, Dahls and the Warrens seem to be inseparable variables. The paranormal investigators are best known for the Annabelle doll that resides in the museum, but other dolls such as the Shadow Doll we discussed earlier also live there. We're gonna start with Annabelle. She may be a household name due to the film franchise, but how well do you actually know her? Well, Annabelle was gifted to a student nurse in the 1970s. Why she received the doll, we don't know, but it wasn't the innocent present that it seemed. Soon after the nurse got Annabelle, strange things began to happen. The incident surrounding the doll became more and more violent. This is where the Warrens came in. The pair deemed the doll to be demonically possessed. They took Annabelle from the nurse back to their home. She's now kept in a glass box with the famous warning. Warning, positively do not open. Another doll that the Warrens place in their occult museum was the Satanic Idol doll, and it's just as creepy as the name suggests. The Satanic Idol is pretty small and looks like any other doll. It was apparently first discovered by a man who was walking in a forest in Connecticut who simply ran into it. Naturally, he was bemused as to why there was a random doll in the middle of the forest, but only seconds later he began to feel very weak. Strangely, the further he got away from the doll, the stronger he began to feel again. When the Warrens came into its possession, Lorraine reportedly began to suffer terribly in its presence. She began to levitate and would find herself in bizarre, immobile states. But the Warrens still kept the doll. It remains in the occult museum to this day. You would think this would be enough dolls for one haunted mansion. Well, apparently not for the Warrens. They also have two earless voodoo dolls who bring ill health to anybody in possession of them. Lorraine Warren allegedly saved a child's life by removing them from the house they were originally kept in, but the dolls did occasionally cause havoc in the occult museum like Annabelle, the Shadow Doll, the Satanic Idol, and the Earless Dolls, they all remain there. Ed and Lorraine Warren are immortalized in paranormal history thanks to their investigation throughout the late 20th century. Now paranormal investigating may be a strange hobby to some, and an even weirder job. But whether or not you believe in these things, the Warrens did bring a sense of relief and rescue to many people. And for this, you've got to give them some credit. So what do you make of these haunted objects in the War and Occult Museum? Human experience is incredible. As humans we have the potential to undergo a range of different things in the course of our lives. Some people have it easy and others not so much. There have been many people who have survived insane and harsh conditions with no real explanation as to how it could have happened. Alaska a man in Alaska who survives in the snow. Can you imagine surviving for three weeks with almost no food or water in the snow? Most people wouldn't make it, but a man by the name of Tyson Steele did. He was living in a small cabin in the woods, northwest of Anchorage, Alaska. After living there for a few months, he made a small mistake that could have been fatal. While using his wood stove, he sent a spark out through the chimney and it managed to land on the roof of his home. He didn't realize what had happened until early in the morning when he had awoken to drips of plastic. When he made it outside, he saw his house was entirely in flames. In an attempt to salvage whatever he could, he went back to grab blankets and his rifle. He had a brown Labrador named Phil, who he believed escaped out of the house during the fire. To his dismay, he realized Phil had been caught in the flames. Only when he heard the dog's cries, he explained the pain and anguish he felt for his beloved dog, describing his scream being so loud and agonizing. Once the fire had settled, Steele went through his shell of a home to collect whatever food was still intact. Unfortunately, most of the canned goods had exploded due to the heat. He found a few cans and despite the smoke taste, he was happy to have any food for survival. He then created a makeshift tent from a tarpaulin that was inside the cabin and tried to build a dome around the stove. With temperatures below zero, completely alone with no one nearby and surrounded by snow, it is an absolute miracle that he was able to survive. When asked about his techniques in surviving, he explained that he had never had any formal training and had simply spent a lot of time outdoors. Besides that, he had watched a few YouTube videos over the years. So how? He found, after an unusual length of time passed with no contact between Steele and his family, 
the police went looking for him. Luckily, he was able to keep his wood stove burning with tree bark and a candle he had on him, and used the ash to write SOS in large letters. The authorities were able to successfully rescue him after three weeks, taking him back to safety in a helicopter. He went to stay with his family afterwards and spoke about his excitement to spend time with to help him heal. There is no doubt that many people would not be able to survive this kind of situation. Was still lucky or had he made all of the right moves? No one can be too sure but we are more than glad he made it out alive. Alexander Kovalev Going for a hike is a fairly common practice. After all, thousands of people hike each day. It can be a wonderful way to get in touch with nature and enjoy the beauty that Mother Nature has provided us with. But we don't often consider the possibility of something going wrong. Many people die in forests and wilderness of any kind on a regular basis with no reason to explain how they ended up there. The Tager Forest in Siberia is extremely vast and gets covered with meters of snow each year. For that reason, most people avoid the forest at that time of year. The chances of survival are slim to none when you consider all of the factors at play. Kovalev was working in a Siberian village in September 2017 when he went missing. His truck was left with a tank full of gas and his glasses were inside. Leaving his truck behind with blurry vision didn't make much sense. He wasn't seen for two weeks and people began to worry. Eventually, he mysteriously appeared from the Tager forest with frostbite all over his legs. He was hospitalized and when later asked about what had happened, he refused to talk about it. He was traumatized by the experience and he wasn't able to provide any answers. His own children tried to understand and asked what he was doing in the forest to begin with and he told them that he didn't know. What's even more shocking about this already shocking survival is that he wasn't in an area that's known to be home to brown bears, black bears, wolves, and the endangered Amur tigers. The fact that he was able to successfully survive two weeks without supplies in the middle of winter and surrounded by vicious animals is hard to wrap your head around. Do you think Kovalev went into the forest on purpose? Was he mentally sane when he made his way into the forest? Since he's refusing to talk, it's difficult to say, but no one in their right mind would embark on a journey in those conditions. Keith Parkins, our last mysterious survival, took place back in 1952. A two-year-old boy named Keith Parkins was in Ritter, Oregon with his family visiting his grandparents. His grandfather lived on a remote ranch that was surrounded by forests. Keith was playing out in the yard on his own and his grandfather kept coming back to check on him every few minutes. When he looked out the window and couldn't see Keith, he panicked and ran outside looking for him. He searched the area with no luck and when the evening rolled around everyone was very concerned. The police arranged a search party and they looked all night. Luckily, they stumbled upon Keith in the morning, laying face down on a frozen pond, unconscious, but still alive. To make matters even weirder, he was found eight miles from his grandfather's house. His jacket was off and his clothes were ripped, but there were no signs of physical injury. When taking his age and the terrain into account, it would have taken him approximately 20 hours to make it where he was found. To survive that distance in the dark of night in the winter would have been nearly impossible, so theorists got to work. Many suggested that he may have been abducted because that would have been the only way he could have traveled so far over the period of time. Unfortunately, since Keith was only two years old, he struggled to provide the police or with much information. As he grew older, he didn't have any memory of the night so it still remains a mystery today. The possibility of Keith's abduction makes the most sense, but it raises a few questions. If he was abducted, why was he left behind? Why were his clothes ripped, but he was left unharmed? How did he survive the cold weather without a jacket? Keith was extremely fortunate to be found unconscious. However, experts still can't understand how he was able to survive the night. Do you have any theories on what could have happened to Keith that night? With no memories to rely on, we may never find the missing piece to the puzzle. It's interesting to look at these stories and think about how you could react if you were in their position. Would you come out alive or would you not make it past a few hours? As humans, our ability to survive in absurd situations is phenomenal. 
Some people are able to escape death and continue living their lives as if nothing had happened. Others may not even remember their near loss of life experience but were lucky enough to survive it anyway. We'll never know what would happen if we were thrown into any one of these situations, but it's comforting to know that even in the most devastating of situations, survival is possible. Just looking at these three cases, it's clear that we as a human race are tenacious and resilient when it comes to keeping ourselves alive. But what do you make of these three survivors? Yellowstone National Park is perhaps one of the most feared locations on our planet, due to the fact that it houses a massive supervolcano beneath it. Because of this, researchers are always carrying out research in the hopes of better understanding it. Recently, University of Utah's Robert Smith made an interesting discovery saying that he noticed a change in the water levels at Yellowstone Lake. Whenever this change is, it's important that further tests are conducted. Geologist Dr. Robert Christensen then revealed the discovery during a documentary. He said the following, one of the most interesting additional pieces of data came along after the early field work and the completion of the initial geologic studies. Bob Smith at the University of Utah was interested in seeing if we could look for signs of contemporary deformation in the Yellowstone caldera. He'd recognized some of these indications, particularly in changes in lake levels of different parts of Yellowstone Lake, and because it's so large, he felt there were indications that the lake basin itself was being tilted. Because of this, the lake level was rising at one end of the lake and falling at the other end, end quote. Dr. Christensen explained how his colleague made the discovery going on to say the following. He was interested in seeing whether we could actually measure this by some direct means. So one of the things I did at the time was to get funding together to get the USGS topography division involved. We felt that with as much as deformation as there appear to be that there should be measurable changes and elevations in the park. We finally got the funding together and got the survey done and the data was provided to Bob Smith and his group and they in turn integrated it into a series of elevation changes throughout the caldera. They demonstrated that the caldera over a 50-year period of time had come up around two-thirds of a meter. Even the magma was intruding the crust or was heating the hydrothermal system causing it to expand and elevate the crust. Something was definitely going on, end quote. What many people aren't aware of is the world's volcanic activity has dramatically increased. Volcanoes from all around the world are erupting faster and more frequently than ever. On top of this, earthquakes are also on the rise. So why is this happening? As of right now, researchers have said there's no concrete answer and that more studies need to be carried out. Data has shown us that, in the 20th century alone, there was over 3,500 volcanic eruptions. That works out as around 30 eruptions per year. As mentioned, earthquakes are also on the rise. In 2018 alone, there was over 14,000 earthquakes recorded and researchers and scientists have suggested the world could be preparing for some kind of world-changing trauma. If this does happen, it's said it will have the power to split out continents. Some have even come forward and said we're in the middle of a pole shift and during this time the Earth's core is heating up causing oceans to heat up and causing volcanoes and earthquakes to release the built-up stress. There's also been a growing concern for Yellowstone. Researchers have said that if Yellowstone was to erupt it would have massive consequences. Teams of scientists have found that after the eruption of a supervolcano, it's often been recorded that there tends to be a massive cooling events that occurs around the world. This is due to the fact that the ejection of a large amount of volcanic ash causes a global darkness event, preventing the planet from warming up and causing a global ice age. This appears to have also been the case a mere 100,000 years ago when the Toba super eruption occurred and nearly drove humanity to extinction. Prior to this event, there was an estimated 1 million human population. After the event took place, there was only 11,000 humans left of which caused a massive effect that allows us to see the time in which such an event took place. Additionally, this rapid death count occurred when the Toba super eruption caused a global blackout and this lasted for more than 10 years. During this time, a massive ice age occurred and an atmospheric cooling event that lasted for another 1,000 years. Given these calculations, it's expected that if the Yellowstone supervolcano were to erupt in the modern day, 
The amount of ash spewed would travel throughout the atmosphere and block out the sun from all around the world, leading to a modern-day ice age that would prevent the sun from being seen for six to seven years, creating an endless darkness for all life on Earth and record low temperatures never before recorded. Additionally, the Yellowstone supervolcano lies close to a number of sensitive fault lines all across the West Coast. It's believed that this massive amount of pressure released in one moment coupled with the massive amount of force generated via the super eruption will create a domino effect of seismic activity that could lead to fault lines completely sliding in opposite directions causing a number of massive earthquakes all across the West Coast. The earthquakes would be some of the largest ever to have been recorded and would only lead to further damage of roads, highways, cities and nearby constructions completely blocking off those affected from reaching the help they would need. Another piece of news to come out of Yellowstone last year was that with 50 seismic trackers picked up tremors. It's also known that the Yellowstone volcano is sitting on top of a hot spot and this means that every so often magma starts to rise to the surface. Rather worrying, these scientists have said that should an earthquake occur, it would take less than two weeks before a catastrophic reaction is triggered. Researchers said if it did blow it would be catastrophic. It appears that the eruption of the Yellowstone supervolcano would be roughly 10,000 times larger than that of the eruption at Mount St. Helens. As of right now, teams of scientists and researchers have said they're keeping a close eye on the data and that any updates they'll get they'll release to the public. So what do you guys make of this recent announcement?